You can't imagine how many people have approached me earlier on asking me the many questions that they want to ask you. So I'm going to start with a ironic one. It is a question which is intended to be provocative. It's a question at the same time which has been probably asked of you many times. It's also a question for which you have probably already got an answer, and many people here who've heard you elsewhere already know the answer, but they've said to me that they are watching for the nuance by which you answer. That, that will be interesting. And the question obviously is, uh, when you were released, there were announcements made about a timeline for your succession. There has since then been some speculation um, when the Prime Minister said that he might remain if he was, if was demand for him to remain, and many other things happening in the media of which you know about. So I think people here are interested, they know your answer, they're prepared for it, but they're interested to hear how you're going to answer it. So please, sir. <laughs> Did you realize that I suffered enough in prison? <laughs> Why do you want to impose difficulty? I thought I'm coming to Singapore to enjoy because, myself. Because sir, we, we, are, we, want, we want to help you as much as we can, preparing you for a time when you will be asked, you'll be asked many, many more questions of this sort. And I can guarantee you, and I would like the audience to confirm, that in this room you really have good friends who wish the best Thank for you. you. <laughs> and you. only good friends help to prepare you yes. for when you might have a less friendly audience. Absolutely. Because only good friends will ask strong, tough, provocative questions. Mm. Now, all right. Um, in January this year, when I was still in prison, the party leaders, Tun Mahathir, Aziza, and the other uh, DAP, uh, Lim Guan Eng, and Mohammad Sabu of Amana, <clears throat> converged and agreed upon a plan. One, the manifesto, institutional reforms. Two, that we endorse Mahathir as the Prime Minister. And to secure an immediate release for Anwar, and Anwar to assume premiership, and they all signed. Now, it's four months since the elections. My working relations with the relationship with Mother is not only cordial but uh, close. Uh, I know some of you are cynical, you can conceive and smile. <laughs> but uh, in all honesty, I would say this. And I told this to Mahathir, we used to joke about it. I said, our team, when I was finance and then deputy prime minister, working with him, was unprecedented. We were very close, we worked together extremely well, and we had such uh, devotion to the, for the country, and, and we, want, we just were obsessed to make sure that Malaysia uh, succeed, becomes a vibrant uh, 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 economy. And then, as Yeats said, things fall apart, the center cannot hold. And true enough, we became, again, I think uh, in recent history, very bitter enemies, rancorous exchange, no holes barred. And I, literally, I was in the prison mm. for six years. This is a tough times. And then he came, met me in, in court. He couldn't see me. Nobody could see me in prison except Azizah and the children. So he came to court and uh, said, Anwar, we have a problem now. I said to myself, oh, please, I can forgive, but don't bother me again, please. I didn't say that. This was my, I, said, I thought to myself. But he was, seems quite genuine. He says, no, we have to save the country. And uh, we, have to, we need to team up because the whole institution is destroyed. Uh, you can't hear any, about any positive news in Washington Journal, New York Times, or Washington 
Financial Times, except for 1MDB, 1MDB, 1MDB. And, and uh, this uh, growing cynicism against uh, what's being, whatever is being said by the government. I was exceedingly polite with him. I did not give a commitment. Aziza was with me, looked uh, very sad. My two daughters in the corner were crying, failing to understand why Papa has to entertain this man. Month passed. To Mahadev's credit, he was more focused on the agenda for reform. He supported our position on judicial independence, free media, reading the country of corruption. And he said he will do whatever is required to help save the country. And he will serve for a while and secure Anwar's release and allow him to assume what is then, he said so rightfully, his as the new Prime Minister. So I have no reason, therefore, after this month, to question his sincerity. He has undertaken this reform agenda. But I know him, many of you know him. Of course, our style is quite different. Sometimes, uh, you know, some of his statements and remarks seem to be unduly provocative. Um, I mean, Singaporeans, of course, have learned that a long time ago. Now, that refers to the Chinese. But any way possible, when asked, I said to him, look, in the overall context, Mahadev is for reform, for investments, and will not discriminate when it comes to potential investments into the country. There were deals that we were suspicious of, which some of us feel quite dubious, or smack of corruption involved, or, for that matter, that the country can ill afford, given the state of the economy now, that need to be either cancelled or postponed. And that's all. But otherwise, please be assured that I, on my part, have no reason to doubt his sincerity. He has been reiterating every other day because everybody kept on asking, I don't blame you because even in Malaysia, the media will ask, are you sure? He said, yes, I know I'm my successor. And then <laughs> they asked me, do you trust him? I said, yes, I do. So it is, uh, I think both of us should have a taped answer that we can just uh, <laughs> make ready to question us. Thank you. To, to follow up on that, to what extent do you think Mahathir's participation in the elections this year round made the difference? Or would have the coalition won anyway? I would say that in 2013, many of you know that we won 52% mm -hmm. of popular votes. We, didn't, we were not able to form the government because we were short of numbers of members of parliament. So we did extremely well. But still, we needed that critical base support. And uh, in 2018, I was in prison. We thought that the ideal candidate uh, then to lead the uh, coalition was Mahathir. So I believe that he was also instrumental in uh, affecting that change. What was remarkable, not well appreciated by many outside observers, that at the age of 92, then last year, he went on um, such a campaign trail, uh, clearly punishing schedule, and every day and night was there meeting electorates. And um, people then tend to also realize that Give him a chance. He's just asking, let me make amends and give me a chance to correct the excesses and the mistakes. And therefore, I would concede. Okay, all the politicians 
have difficulty in conceding that people are better than him. But I would, in all humility, this is what uh, XPM Chok Tong was telling me about what you learn in prison. One of the things is humility. As, as Eliot, T.S. Eliot have said, the only humility, the only wisdom one can hope to acquire is humility. Humility is endless. So one of the great things I do, I was able to do in prison is to memorize this poem in Shakespeare. <laughs> so you have to be careful. You were also telling us earlier with uh, ESM Go that you've been accused of quoting Shakespeare in audiences <laughs> like this when you quote the Quran when you're with the political rallies otherwise. So here we won't tell people that you've been quoting T.S. Eliot uh, at a grouping here. However, no, you... People tend to be critical. They said, oh, I know I can't trust him, you know, because he's um, chameleon in a way. He quotes Shakespeare uh, in, in the urban area in New York and he quotes the Quran in the uh, district in Pakistan. Of course. You don't expect me to go Quran in New York <laughs> and Shakespeare in this remote village in Pakistan. So <laughs> I do what I think is, should be done. Thank you. you. You alluded to time in prison. I just wanted to say something and then ask you a question. I think there are many CEOs here, of course, most of whom have not been to prison but have been through very difficult times. Well, those who, some may have gone to prison for different reasons than you have, like I've gone to ISA for a short period. But I think there's a, a lot of people in this room who've gone through adversities. And I think there's, to the same extent that there is a lot of admiration for Dr. Mahathir as a person, who at the age of 93 can come back and lead a country with vegan energy, there is also a huge amount of admiration for you of how you have gone through imprisonment three times with no assurance at all that you would end your political life or even end your life coming back as you have done today. And I think it would be useful for us to hear from you from a personal point of view. How do you go through such an adversity? How do you go through being thrown, being a deputy prime minister to then becoming a detainee, come becoming re and being released again, going back in again, with no assurance that here today you're going to be a prime minister in waiting. How do you keep your spirits up? Because that's something at a personal level that I think many people in this room, for very different reasons, as we go through financial crises and private crises, how do we, how do we find the will to go on? On a lighter note, um when I was released uh, in 2004. There's too many times I was released and jailed so that I got to quote you the year. Because when this was, the, I'm talking about the release in 2004. I was invited by Mandela to Joe Berg, with the whole family. And uh, he, when he saw my children, we got young then, he was visibly, uh, I mean, he was affected and uh, was in tears. And he said to me, Anwar, I don't know what, why we did it. I was looking at my children. In my, we must be mad or crazy. So I said to him, Madiba, we are not mad. But crazy, I totally agree with you. That's a lighter note. No more serious note. Uh, Kennedy, in his profile in Courage, talks about courage and conviction, tenacity of purpose. I think in leadership, in any struggle, you must have conviction. And conviction can be affected with courage. You must have then the tenacity of purpose. But I would add on, you must have compassion. We talk about business or governance. I'm compassion for the, the millions who are marginalized, who depend, who love you, who support, purely with the hope that you are going to help and champion their cause. You can't then become a leader and then start stealing from public purse. So compassion is one. But in my limited experience, certainly forgiveness is another. I mean, we have a larger agenda. We have a country to serve. In, in our case, we say save Malaysia. 
And okay, I suffered. It was a very painful decision. Mind you, it was painful. It was not easy. I'm not a, hip a hypocrite to suggest to you that, oh, I was right, you know, I'm philosophically it's okay. I mean, we can, you have to move on. It's not simple. I know how we, the family and the colleagues suffered. I know how difficult it was when I had to sit with Aziza and Oriza to the end and finally endorse Mahade as the Prime Minister, as our leader. But we decided again with conviction because we want to save the country. So what we learn, you must have principles and conviction. And to me, religion plays a part. And, and my years in prison, I had virtually read on Islam, Christianity, Buddhism, Hinduism, the Chinese philosophy. I remember discussing George Yu. It's beyond Needham, the science and the civilization. You know, Needham. We did discuss those years. Uh, it's beyond that. It's again humanity, again values as integrating force in society and culture, and compassion. And you can't move if you, you are inf inflicted with that disease in the heart of getting angry and not prepared to forgive. You have to let go and move on because for the people, for Malaysians is what? For Anwar to be angry with the past? Yes, they can talk about it, they sympathize, or they even cry. But then for general Malaysians is what? It takes to ensure that Malaysia emerge as a successful nation economically vibrant because only that we can share with the people and therefore we if you use that as a priority for the future then we must be able to forgive and forget the past thank, thank you. you let me just ask you one last question before we uh, open to the floor a very different one but but you mentioned about how malaysia can actually be an example to the islamic world there has been talk about now, a concept like a Malaysia Spring, similar to Arab Spring, and how the example of the government coming into power in Malaysia could set an example not only in other countries, but in particular in other Islamic countries too. Do you see your new government trying to play a more international role in encouraging more democratization, accountability, etc., in other Islamic countries of the world? Mahathir is a great internationalist. In the past, you know, um, I was Deputy Prime Minister, most of domestic policies, he left to me and he was traveling overseas. But now I think we, we, our, the consensus in the leadership is to focus on the economy and the institutions of governance. And um, of course, we have uh, lots of visitors, uh, friends overseas wanting to know exactly what happened, what transpired. And to me, we need to also to articulate this view that the notion that Muslim countries or Muslim societies are unable to grasp democratic values is debunked. We are not the first. We have seen Indonesia, we have seen to extend Turkey, but in Malaysia, the change, the transformation is phenomenal without a loss of one life. Or uh, probably some years in prison, but not one life lost. And I think this is a great feat in modern times. And, um, and, and therefore, it is a challenge in as much as for the Muslim world, but for Malaysia, to prove that we're able to sustain this. But again, what's unique in Malaysia is that this, uh, this was achieved with the total mobilization of forces among Muslims, Christians, Buddhists, Hindus. And this is to me a remarkable feat. People say, well, I know you are a bit diluted as a Muslim because you, think to, you tend to uh, embrace the rest. Uh, the party I lead is a multiracial, multi-religious party. Uh, the vision that we have is a multi-religious, multi-racial vision. 
I am as a person a practicing Muslim. But for the nation, for the society, it is a multicultural, multi-religious society. And uh, I was in Turkey, I was in London, my friends asked, I said, don't give credit just because Malaysia is the so-called Muslim country or Muslim majority. Because we won because of Muslim support, Chinese support, Indian support. And the most remote area in Sarawak called Puncak Borneo, the most remote, which I did not anticipate a victory, is called Puncak Borneo, and we won that seat. You know why? Because of the wisdom of the masses. Never underestimate the wisdom of the people who finally decide what to do, what is right, what is wrong, that to rid the country of corruption and abuse of power. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to now open the floor to questions. There is an app which you can write your questions if you wish to, or if you rather do it in a more traditional way, just raise your hands and I will note you. Uh, any questions? I think that's, is it Piyush? Piyush, please. And Zainal, after that, please. Dr. Sri Piyush Gupta from DBS Bank, it's good to see you up and out about again. Uh, my question is very simple. Do you see in Tun Mahathir at 93 a uh, change and a different person from the person you knew five, ten years ago? Mahathir is Mahathir. <laughs> Tough, frank, provocative, doesn't mean words. Okay, we all understand it. But is he committed to the reform? Yes. Has he made it clear that uh, Malaysia is now and must emerge as a democracy? Democratic accountability? Yes. Uh, does he believe in anti-corruption commission that is independent? Yes. Does he tolerate a f free media? Yes. So in that sense, of course he has changed. Matters his personality, his cynicism, I had to bear with it, which is fine. But when it comes to the issue of governance, he has agreed, and we have no reason to question that. In the last four months, he has been consistent, and he's been tough. In fact, in my discussions with him, he seems to be quite impatient. He said, oh, no, our clicks are a bit slow. The public servants are not pushing along this reform. So you can sense that vigor in him, which I, of course, admire. So I think I must give him that credit. Uh, there are, point, of course, points of issues that I may choose to disagree. I mean, the style, sometimes the combative mood, that because then I said to you, I used to tell him, said, sir, you continue like this. I have a job, the old job of firefighting because you, you, you tend to see it, but that's him. To me, I would concede and tolerate some difference, difference in styles. You have you know, your managers, CEOs, you come and they're different styles. But what is important is that on the fundamental issues, on principles, on policies, we are committed to this agenda. And I want to make sure that this work, this transition is peaceful. There's no problem between Anwar and Mahathir because I want the country to be on a strong foundation. Thank you. Thank you. Zaino, please. Any other questions from this side later on that I can recognize after Zaino? Okay, later on there, thank you. Zaino, please. Microphone here, please. Thank you. Thank you, Gomping. Um, it's good to see you out, Brother Anwar, and welcome back to Singapore. Because uh, from the Anwar, the Anwar I know for a long time, since the 70s, I know you are a friend of Singapore. I have two questions. One is about race, and the other about Singapore-Malaysia relations. When we are faced with a situation, we have a Prime Minister who is 93 years old, and uh, Prime Minister in waiting, who has been out of circulation for a long while, sometimes you wonder whether short term 
needs may overtake the long-term ideals. So the area which is many people's mind is race politics in Singapore, uh, in Malaysia. I know you spoke about it. You spoke about yourself about the results, the tsunamis. But has re has race politics or race in the economy really settled down, or are, do we have to wait for the dust to settle down? And uh, will it be what kind of a challenge it will continue to be? Because we know it has bugged the system for a long while. And uh, how do you see going forward? Race politics, race relations. You talk about tsunami, but when you talk about when we see Kelantan results, you see Trungano results. People are wondering how the Malays there also are thinking in terms of the change. And in that same context, how do you see Singapore-Malaysia relations? Beyond the race, question of race, but the question of the long-term targets and models where we like to look for. Thank you. Hmm. We have all experts here. We have you, Tony Tan, Chok Tong. <laughs> They are very familiar with the subject. Why do you ask me such questions? <laughs> now, uh, on race, I think uh, any observer or student of Malaysian political uh, change or development would concede that there is therefore a clear departure from past policies. You look at the composition of the cabinet, you look at the Minister of Finance, which has not been the case for the last many, many decades. In fact, people tend to assume that after 69 or, or earlier, you will not have a, a non-Malay finance minister or in the key ministries. But this is not the case. We are prepared to showcase that there is this policy adjustments or change. Is this too radical? Yes and no, because we have also to cater for the sentiments. As you rightly pointed out, that in the Malay heartland, in the rural Malay heartland, there is also a sense of insecurity and the onslaught by the Islamic party, which I don't believe represent the more moderate, objective view of Islam. Uh, but let's talk for a separate agenda because the vast majority in the West Coast, including Malays and Muslims, are with us. Uh, but we need to be mindful of that. But in terms of policies, are we prepared to take that bold step to protect the interests of our nation and at the same time assuring the Malays and the Muslims that, look, in no way are we going to marginalize you or ignore your role in society or in, 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 in government. Because the thinking of the younger Malays also have to be taken into consideration. First, the right policy must be a fair, just policy, period. If I have suffered, for example, 10 and a half, almost 11 years in prison, and do not understand what freedom and justice is, I'm just a hopeless being. So I understand, and I attempt to understand what freedom and justice means. And that would require us to appreciate the humanitarian values that transcend race and religion. That is clearly our policy now. Now, pockets of poverty in the midst of plenty, marginalized areas, poor, downtrodden, that must be handled. And it means the majority of the Malays, I'll tell my Chinese friends, you go to some of the remote villages where they become so fanatical because they feel they, feel they have been completely marginalized. No good education, no good health services. But this is not a racial equation. The solution is not race-based. It must be need-based. And I've not met any Chinese friend, Malaysian Chinese, that is opposed to a policy to help the poor, Malays. Their contentions have always been, why deny us a place when we qualify 
either in education or in business. I fully understand and appreciate that. So there is that clear, uh, to me, a policy change. And, I don't, and to me, it's irreversible. At least, in as long as I'm in politics, there's clearly education. I, in 98, when I was sacked, I had a choice. I can form. I think I have a strong Malay base. I've been active in Islamic work, you know. And you are familiar, familiar with that. I think I, the natural method would be to form a, a Malay or Muslim party. And I think then form a coalition with the Chinese base or Indian parties. But no, I decided at that time, no. If I were to move on, I persuaded my friends, you want me to continue to struggle, although I was in prison, it has to be a new Malaysia. A new Malaysia means not ignoring the importance of the Malays or Islam, but a new Malaysia must be multiracial, multiracial. That we did, and I should say, Alhamdulillah, thank God, we were successful for now. We have to sustain that. Now, Singapore-Malaysia relations are the problem, girl. <laughs> I don't see any problem. Yeah. Of course, perception is such, you know, and it's also a style. I used to tell, I don't know whether PM Choktong, uh, former PM Choktong remembers, I said, you know, Singapore and Singapore leaders are too serious and businesslike. <laughs> we tend to, you know, a bit cultural, skate, and then enjoy skate. You know, relax, kid. You know, and uh, give and take, kid. Singapore's dollars and cents. <laughs> so he joked. So the following month, he invited me for Pavarotti show. Well, he he took my word seriously. But unfortunately, I could not because at that time there was some political development. There were uh, some legislation, but but it was interesting. He took my word seriously. So he. He invited me to attend free Pavarotti show, I mean, tell you, I would have loved to attend. But this is an unenlightened note, don't, don't take me serious on that. <laughs> but I think we should. It is, we are neighbors. I mean, it's, it's, it's strong, historically, economically. It is strong. We cannot fail. Uh, and I, I, I don't think it is, I mean, uh, sensible to create any problems with these two countries. And I believe, although Tun Mahathir was a bit firm on some of the you know, earlier contracts, which is okay, confine it to that particular problem and try to resolve it um, at a bi on a bilateral basis through a series of negotiations and things like that. And, and I think you should take into this consideration. Although I, took, I, I mentioned in a lighter vein, but I, I understand, I mean it that it is not just dollars and cents, but you know, take into consideration the nuances, the sensitivity, the need to look forward and to forge that uh, strong bond between the two uh, nations. And um, because, you know, you are losing the ground because the younger generation does not have the same exposure and experience and, and relationship as the first generation or the second generation. So we have to understand that, and therefore we, we need to take additional effort, which means, which I mentioned to Prime Minister Sen Lung when I met him first time after I was in prison, although I was just accompanying the Deputy Prime Minister, uh, was Anwar's role. You know, in Malaysia, they're very, very formal. The arrival of Right Honourable Deputy Prime Minister, Dr. Waziza Ismail, accompanied by Anwar Ibrahim. <laughs> so my role is just to accompany uh, a good spouse. So uh, when I accompanied the, as a good spouse <laughs> to <laughs> call on the Prime Minister when he was there, Prime Minister Sian Lung, I mean, the meeting was very, very cordial, very good, and we reassured. It was, to me, it's a very good gesture, gesture for Prime Minister Sian Lung to be you know, the first uh, to come and visit. And I think these signals are important mm -hmm. because this goes beyond just diplomatic uh, sort of encounters or business deals. I, mean, I think to rebuild the trust. I don't believe, frankly, after, being, after having said this, I honestly don't believe that there is a problem. Good to know, sir. And I...
We're coming to the end, and, I, and there's a question here on Singapore-Malaysia relationships, which I think you've already answered. I do have to say, sir, that in defense of Singapore, since you were last time here as DPM, I think things have changed. <laughs> All our younger ministers now know how to karaoke. <laughs> I think it's probably a requirement for political office. So we're also able to hang loose and be more chilled, uh, like most of our counterparts in ASEAN countries. <laughs> There's one last question, I think. I can take one last question, and then we'll have to close for today. Thank you. Datuk Sri, very nice to see you. Last time I heard you in public uh, forum was back in 1996 in Malaysia. So just following on some of the political developments in Malaysia, there has been a lot of news picking up over the last 72 hours over the Port Dixon by-elections. How to think about it? it is, is it the platform, the step towards what you described as coming back, changes in timeline, or is it just a part of the bigger plan? Uh, as I mentioned earlier, in January this year, when I was still in prison, the plan was then agreed upon by party leaders. That is why Tun Mahade issued a statement yesterday that he, support, uh, he supports that move and that um, that's well uh, with the plan. In Malaysia, the constitution uh, was very uh, is very clear, specific, that uh, a person, uh, to assume premiership, one has to be an elected member of parliament. So um, what was agreed upon was upon the uh, release, then Anwar should be a member of parliament to then later assume office. Am I in a hurry? No. Because I told PM Mahade that I will focus on parliamentary reform. I will, I will make sure that the parliamentary co uh, committee is effective, uh, functional, and parliament is not just a rubber stamp uh, for government policies. So they will then have to uh, have reason, uh, discussions, dialogue with the ministers when tabling policies, and that should be my role. So the first is to contest in a by election. I chose uh, Port Dixon. Uh, then uh, it's up to the election commission to de decide on the date of elections. I don't take things for granted. I've been in politics a long time. I would then go down and appeal to the voters. Uh, and it is very mixed. One of the reasons I chose is because it's almost 50% Malays, close to 30% Chinese, and almost 20% Indians. So it's really a microcosm of Malaysian society. And I want to make sure, inshallah, that I get the majority of Malay votes, majority of Chinese, and majority of Indians. Uh, and, and of course, it's an arduous task, it's grueling. Uh, campaign um, that uh, after hopefully I win then I will sit as a member of parliament working and getting to know the workings of uh, parliament and interacting with the government leaders and PM Mahade uh, until the right time if uh, and when I assume the premiership then I'll make sure that one of the first countries I visit will be Singapore. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you sir. With a, with a very apt closing remark, I, I should only amend it by saying it should not be an if and when. It should be purely a when you become Prime Minister of Malaysia. We certainly welcome you back here again to deliver us your, the platform of the government at that time. I can only say in the defense of Singapore that we didn't give you lunch today because we wanted to save it for when you come back again as Prime Minister of Singapore. Ladies and gentlemen, can we have a warm applaud and thanks for Dr. Sari Ibrahim for your being here today, sir.